namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa bhutang dhammang sankhang namasami Sometimes I, I, some of you don't seem to quite see the difference between uh, kind of analytical thought and reflective thinking. And so uh, I know sometimes we, this, uh, this difference is, is not really uh, made usually. And reflective thinking is contemplative thought. Uh, is is not really encouraged very much in our society. It's more analytical. Solve our problems through analyzing them. Uh, think about yourself and analyze yourself. These these are the kind of ways that we use our mind, our thinking mind. Reflective thought is is not analytical. Not trying, it's not coming from the position of, of uh, taking things apart and, and uh, trying to figure out why we are the way we are or, and the kind of problems from the personal uh, assumptions we make. But reflective thought is using thoughts themselves to emphasize, to direct our attention that's the here and now. That's why Buddha Dhamma Sangha, all these, these words are not just to, to sit and think about them, or, but to, uh, and, and uh, let the mind kind of proliferate around them, but to uh, their suggestions to the mind in order to observe and witness, contemplate, The word contemplation comes from the Latin uh, templum. A templum or a temple was a place designated for contemplation, where it was kind of uh, probably in the ancient times uh, when man started to philosophize or wonder about uh, their existence and what is the meaning and purpose, then. Uh, there would be a, a spot designated where uh, a human being could go and sit in that place and contemplate the nature of the universe, the stars at night and the meaning of life and all the rest of it. That was the original temple. So contemplation is, uh, is uh, say, the temple, say, for all of us, really, is the the five khandas. We're sitting here with these five khandas. This is our temple, our templum, and we contemplate it. It's through, this is what, this is, what is affecting us most in our lives, isn't it? This, this, these five aggregates, the, the body, feelings, perceptions, volition, consciousness. Self-analysis is, is uh, it coming from a view of, a, of a, a belief in personality as being something that's really mine. And, and so uh, that if we, if we analyze ourselves, then we tend to reinforce the view that we are somebody um, and the assumptions that go along with that. Anatta then is, is a reflective teaching to, to counteract the tendency to believe in, in the personality as, a, as more than merely a conditioning of the mind and not really a, a kind of permanent or semi-permanent person.
Anita Dukanata are reflective teachings, the Four Noble Truths. They're, they're tools to use. Suffering, the, the origin, the cessation, and the path of no suffering. Is, these are not beliefs or Buddhist uh, doctrines, but truths to be examined, investigated, and proven. Many people prefer meditation retreats that are maybe very concentrated, where the, there's a refinement of consciousness, conscious experience, where the, the kind of level of, of uh, um, one's awareness is on a very refined place. I remember talking to some people in America about their practice, and there, uh, there's a kind of a longing and strong desire to to develop high levels of concentration uh, in order to see the arising and passing away in in its very subtle form. So that uh, if one holds to this view, then then uh, then there's still very much a a basic delusion in the mind that that you have to get to this high level of concentration to actually witness and reflect on the Four Noble Truths. So that sometimes people's meditation is very much determined, a determination to get to a very, uh, you know, to a very controlled environment uh, where there is, you know, nothing but just uh, a very organized and uh, very routine, very controlled situation, and where nothing kind of harsh, unpleasant, or distracting is, is at a minimum, and through this kind of sensory deprivation and through the uh, kind of continuous practice of a very, of a, of a simple method, then there is, the mind does concentrate. And, uh, and of course, the, the more concentrated you are, the more blissful you tend to be. It's very blissful <coughs> to be very refined, to have, to have nothing coarse to deal with. And this is very skillful, admittedly. It's not, not uh, putting it down as, as of no use, but recognize that it, it's still, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a skillful practice in developing um, they mental exercises, but it also can be very misleading. The fact that that many people tend to be looking for their insights uh, and expecting insights only from these highly concentrated states uh, and very subtle, uh, the subtle impressions of arising and ceasing, and on on these these very uh, highly concentrated subtle levels. I admittedly started out in that way myself because that was a very attractive uh, thing to be doing, really, to to live in a very controlled environment and uh, to try to develop these this this uh, this kind of concentration. So that uh, my first year, I I was quite successful at, at this and and uh, due to you know uh, ability to get my own way and and uh, to uh, practice I, mean, I was quite sincere and and, uh, and um, there are people very willing to support and do what I wanted but in I found later on that the real uh, Useful insights come not through through the, the extreme forms of concentration, but through uh, more ordinary, just the awakened mind, the, the kind of ordinary levels of awareness. 
to be able to see arising and ceasing and to see, to notice the, the first, second, third, fourth noble truths in very ordinary, <coughs> the ordinariness of life. Because then you can actually develop the path, the Eightfold Path, which is not dependent upon our condition. Because it became apparent to me that, that how, could you, how could enlightenment ever be dependent upon controlling condition? It just is a, doesn't make sense. If, you're, if there's any effort to control uh, condition, uh, and, and then what you're experiencing is dependent, then you assume that what you, what you are experiencing depends on those conditions. So when those conditions change, one can, can be quite, quite angry, quite upset, quite disturbed when, when you lose control of the conditions and that very anger and, uh, and that uh, selfishness that, that comes from that attitude, of course, certainly uh, could not be uh, an enlightened state of being. I'd like to bring uh, Dhamma practice to manageable, to, to daily life as, as we live it, to, to just the, to the ordinariness of, the, of our existence, to where most of our life is spent, not in highly controlled uh, environments, nor in high levels of concentration or sen- sensory deprivation, but in the kind of uh, daily life of uh, uh, as we as we experience it. Now the I've talked this over with with, with various teach with personal teachers and and various students, but um, sometimes I think they don't believe me mm. um, because. Uh, they, 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 they're still very much uh, interested in this, in this other approach. Now just the word Nibbana, in other words, Nirvana or Nibbana is a word that is, is uh, you know, can be a, a kind of exalted word. It, uh, to realize nibbana is the highest attainment, or uh, and so nibbana becomes something way beyond the ordinary experience of life. And and you hear even in Theravadan countries, monks saying that uh, you know you can't realize nibbana, or nibbana is they've they've made it such an impossible uh, probability that uh, the kind of uh, the word itself is almost, and what it actually means, and what it's meant to mean, is almost reduced to, is forgotten, and and uh, it becomes kind of a, a high-level attainment rather than a realization of non-grasping. Now that's very important to me to 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 regard nibbana as a realization of non-grasping, because that I can do. That is something within. My capabilities as a, in the in an ordinary situation. It's, if I start thinking I'm I I have realized nibbana, uh, that could be uh, an an egotistical assumption. That's not the point. Whether 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 uh, one thinks one has or hasn't realized nibbana, uh, because that's not really the issue, is it? It's not a point of me realizing it. But of using that particular uh, word and applying it to 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 ordinary experience. Like I would, I I used to just practice. I thought grasping. I'd take just some ordinary article like this handkerchief, and I I just practice grasping, and then I'd I'd really I'd really. Uh, uh, Get the feeling for you, know, like hanging on to something, life or death, kind of grasp, clutching at this hanky. 
and I get the feeling of this kind of tension, and, and I do it quite, quite intentionally, uh, deliberately to just really grasp and, and be with this sense of grasping something with my right hand, and then letting go. And so I'd, I'd let it go. And then I'd, then I'd contemplate non-grasping. I'm not, there's no more grasping of this handkerchief. Now that is, sounds like, you know, you're just playing games, doesn't it, to most people, because uh, Nibbana is, uh, is the highest attainment, so it couldn't be as simple as that. But do you realize how, what it takes to, to contemplate, to actually apply your mind to an ordinary uh, kind of mundane uh, thing that we do? like grasping, and then like just putting it down, and, and the feeling of non-grasping with the hand, just with, with one's hand. And that's a reflection, you're reflecting on it, contemplating it. Just grasping, non-grasping, letting go. With Niroda, the cessation of a condition that uh, that is, say, uh, observing when a, when a condition is no more, when it has ceased, like say anger and then non-anger, uh, so that you you're you're realizing Niroda, the cessation. So that you, you're taking a particular condition, say feeling angry or w whatever emotion feeling you, you might be having, recognizing it as is, it's like this, and then it's absence when it, when it has ceased. Non-anger is this way. And so we, we're, we, we can apply these, this to, to quite ordinary daily life situation without having to okay, go to refined levels of consciousness to do it. And this, this means that we can integrate practice in, into the way we live our lives. And this is developing the Eightfold Path. Cultivating the Eightfold Path based on this, this uh, right understanding. Now, even though you might think you understand Nibbana and Niroda and that, it's not a matter of, of, of understanding the words and the theory and, and even uh, the idea of grasping and non-grasping as, an, as, a, as a physical experience, but in really, really uh, being with grasping and non-grasping, being with a condition that has arisen and being with its absence. And and not not trying to 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 uh, kind of make anything out of it. Just the, not to to uh, to to build any kind of illusions about your attainment or lack of it around these things. But just be in these very humble ways of reflecting in, in the ordinariness of life. You can actually uh, understand, have the right understanding. The, what is subject to arising is subject to ceasing. Self and no self. Let's uh, say, I am. I am Sumedho Bhikkhu and I am and this kind of person, that I was born in Seattle, Washington, and I, I have a, a university degree, and, and I was in the Navy, and I, and I had, I think of all the qualifications, or then all the kind of uh, I-ams that, that are unpleasant, I mean, these are the kind of 
the curriculum vitae IMs, aren't they? The stuff you report on, there's, there's a lot of stuff we don't tell anyone. <laughs> uh, there's um, biographical sketches. They all make it sound like supermen, don't they? You know, Anjan Mun's biography is a classic. It's all about it's all the kind of miracul miracles he performs, and uh, it's uh, it's been highly criticized by serious monks in Thailand because it it tends to convey the miraculous as as the, as the way or as something to emulate rather than rather than trying to encourage us to practice the middle way, which is neither extreme. So we kind of can be in awe and impressed with, uh, with somebody's uh, miraculous uh, uh, superpowers, uh, able to, to perform fantastic feats and manifest mangoes out of season and, and <laughs> out of your mouth and things like that. No doubt that would be much more entertaining to do this evening. <laughs> But it, uh, I can't really do it, no, no <laughs> point. Of, you know, but, but even if I could, you know, that still wouldn't be the point, would it? That's not, that's not really important. Mangoes can grow on trees much better that they, we just follow the natural laws than try to kind of influence them with, with our own, uh, the powers of our mind. Because it's what humanity really needs to learn is how to, uh, humble ourselves and live within the boundaries of the natural law, and not try, not try to say out of ego, out of a, out to promote ourselves or to impress others or to, to be special, to be a fantastic person. Uh, these, this is this is not what meditation practice is about. Not to to make me into some kind of fantastic, special personality. And if that's what I'm doing, then, then I am uh, really cheating the Dhamma. Ajahn Chah's comments about the Ajahn Man biography was that it was, it wasn't, wasn't real Dhamma. It was a, just a kind of reiteration of all the kind of tales people have about the miraculous powers of a monk. But he said, Ajahn Chah said, Ajahn Man really taught Dhamma. He didn't teach that other stuff. His whole aim and emphasis was on the realization of the truth. And, and yet, how many people would prefer to, to recite all the miracles, the fantastic feats, uh, and make that the, the important thing and forget the real message? When I was uh, in the previous lecture, evening lecture, uh, talking about just space and form and how to use these, these, uh, the, how to use uh, similes and and uh, the, the the that which are quite ordinary in our experience, like the space, what we see and the forms in the space, say in this room, or the sound of silence and and sound and noises, the cry of the peacocks and the airplanes and the rustling sounds of movement. Or with thought in silence, the emptiness around the thought, space around thought, uh, in order to investigate and really observe space, not as some kind of absolute space, but relative space, spaces uh, sound of silence, emptiness, no self, no greed, no hatred, no delusion, as, as, as we're experiencing it now, to note, say, 
the, these as, as the here and now Dhamma. Rather than thinking that the unconditioned is some kind of very uh, kind of uh, unusual experience that is that we have to get a high level of concentration in order to to really to realize, uh, and we ha- we have to develop these these fantastic powers to in order to to really have a clear insight into anatta. And so much of, uh, say, in in, uh, in um, modern Buddhism is, is where the the actual practices of meditation have become uh, very uh, kind of ways of of uh, concentrating the mind, uh, very and highly uh, technical, and yet one is oftentimes surprised at how little insight and understanding of Dhamma there is in regards to the noble truths. In the questioning, self-questioning form, like when, when you ask yourself a question, you know, who am I, or what is the sound of the clap of one hand? <laughs> Any kind of question. What was the name of that monk that was here? What, where did I put my key? And these kind of things. If you notice, just the questioning form is a mind stopper, doesn't it? It stops your mind. Your mind, thinking mind, uh, halts for a minute. Where, where is my key? <laughs> the mind, you know, your, your mind at that, mo- my mind is, is, it has, it's, uh, is, it's, it's nonplussed. And then, of course, they oh, my my bag or my pocket. Or maybe Buddha Blamro has it. Now I come up with kind of suggestions of places to find it. But if I'm not really, say, in this explanation, interested in where the key is, because I don't really have a key. <laughs> <laughs> but just in the in how to, the the result of a question, uh, so that you're you're really witnessing to the the mind that isn't sure, that is uncertain, where there's no thought, at that point where it's nonplussed, it's the thinking process is stopped before you start, one, well, it could be here or there. So you, you notice that, that uh, the, 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 the mind with no thought in it. And you become, you make yourself familiar with that by, by say, practicing with that, like the who am I uh, kind of self-inquiry, where you, you just keep asking yourself, who am I? And then you, then you and, and observing the, that, that space, that absence of thought after you ask the question. To realize that, no, there's, there's, no, there's no thinking in that moment. There's awareness, consciousness, but there's, there, at that moment there's, uh, the, the, the thinking process has stopped functioning. Those are the points, to, th- those, those are good practices to develop, just to, to become so familiar, so completely at ease with non-thinking.
then take a, a sentence, just like a, I am uh, a human being. And one can, then the, the, the investigation of the space around the word, that before you think it, deliberately thinking, I, and then there's space. No thought in that space. Am a human being, period. Nothing. Because this, uh, this a realization is, it means that it's, it's quite, it's here and now, it's nothing you, that, that uh, isn't here or that isn't always here, it's just you don't realize it. And suddenly you do realize, non-thinking. How many of you think that you think all the time? Or are very identified with the inner chatter and inner whispering and the inner dialogues and, the, and all the uh, kind of proliferations, conceptual proliferations, the papancha of your mind. And, and that, is, that is, is such a strong kind of and stressful experience that these very simple uh, kind of ways of investigating non-thinking, then you are realizing the thought and no, and no thought. With the sound of silence, and the, the, the nada, it, if, you, if you concentrate on that, if you pay attention to the nada, the thought ceases. You just, you know, there's no thinking. There's just the sound, the subtle sound in the ears. So that the conditioned, now, now taking the, going back to the to the uh, metaphysical side of Buddhism, the condition arising and ceasing in the unconditioned, the born and the unborn, the created and uncreated, the death bound and the deathless. Uh, all these, these, this, these, this, these two, the the sankata, the uh, dhamma and the asankata dhamma. is a realization. And, but, if you, and, but if you perceive the unconditioned in and Nibbana and, and enlightenment and uh, all of these, these kind of words and exalt them to a point that they become only possible in highly concentrated states uh, and very dependent on special conditions and and uh, all kinds of other influences, then that, that is of no use to us because our life as a human being is like this, isn't it? It's, it's sitting, standing, walking, lying down, breathing. It's getting up, it's putting on your clothes, it's, it's uh, cooking food and washing the dishes. It, it's going from here to there, walking from this place to that place. It, this is, this is the majority of your life is going to be this way, isn't it? You're going to have a few maybe fantastic experiences during a lifetime and, uh, you know, really great highs once in a while and then, then you're going to have uh, maybe a, a few uh, horrendous experiences and, and you're going to have uh, fluctuations of pleasure and pain and happiness and suffering and praise and blame and all that. But, say, uh, even outside, even a, a life of, say, uh, continuous difficulties and, and ups and downs, really, when it gets right down to it, most of our lives are about just the, the, the ordinariness of being, of feeling and breathing and, 
and existence before it, it uh, before say it goes into any any anything ex, uh, extreme. So that this is why I keep emphasizing uh, the the ordinary rather than the special. Not that I'm again. I'm, you know, we all prefer the special on our desire minds. I'd love to have a. Love to get highly con- in a state where absolutely nothing is impinging on my senses, and I can just spend hours blissful states and not hear the telephone ring, not hear anything, not be asked any qu- stupid questions, not be <laughs> bothered in any way, not not have to to hear any anything unpleasant, not have to. Uh, just be in a state where nothing on nothing uh, problematical is happening. But life isn't like that. I mean, you can kind of have those moments, have those uh, things. But then, but most of life is really uh, this way. And so. Uh, not to, to I, I don't find this depression, I find this a relief. That, that Dhamma applies to just the most mundane, ordinary thing that we do. There's nothing that we do that isn't that. Going to the toilet, all these things are, are, can, be, can be done mindfully. They're Dhamma rather than self. They just uh, taking care of the functions and and the uh, of our bodies, learning how to to bathe them, how to feed them, how to live with them, and and uh, take care of them, clean them, and so forth is 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 dumb. Or it can be if it's taken from the the uh, kind of position of of it's only in in the uh, special situations that you can practice. The rest of the time you can't. I've heard that. You have to. You have to. Have, you can only really practice vipassana on a very highly controlled retreat, and uh, that's because the aim is to develop uh, an awareness of subtleties and refinement. In cultivating the path, then in the eightfold path, it's uh, one has to give up those kind of inclinations because the path is here and now and, it, and, it, and it's not dependent upon uh, techniques or special supportive conditions. It can be in a battlefield or in, in any kind of unpleasant, totally uh, say undesirable situation as well as all the desirable ones. The time, the place are not the obstacles. It's the, it's the understanding and the realization that allow us to develop this uh, eightfold path. With the flow of life, we <laughs> talking to some people about their experiences of, say, grief and sorrow at loss of loved ones. And then many a Buddhist thinks that you shouldn't, if you're really mindful, you won't feel any grief. So your your sweet old mother dies, and you and you find yourself grieving, <laughs> and, and you can think. Well, I, if I were really mindful, I wouldn't be grieving because, you know, uh, it says, you know, that you're, 
Grief is a, is a result of attachment, so I must be attached to something, I'm not mindful. So we can also suppress our grief and our sorrow and our feelings by trying to be the kind of bhikkhu or meditator who is, is trying to be mindful all the time. And, and, often to, and that means that we repress our feelings, doesn't it? But I don't find that at all helpful or conducive towards wisdom, to, to just control my feelings and suppress them in order to look like a good bhikkhu. Even though I, I, I do tend to, you know, I find it embarrassing to, to cry because I'm conditioned to. But, uh, my generation, um, I mean, I think in the following, in the 60s, they're kind of allowing men to cry was, was more acceptable. But my conditioned years were, were uh, that, uh, for God's sake, don't let anyone see you crying. Babies cry. No matter what they say when you're a little, you're a baby. So, the, um, but I don't find just trying to control things, think, calling that mindfulness, is it? Trying to, to uh, resist and control our feelings, but to recognize our feelings as Dhamma. So my mother died about three, two years ago, and and uh, I was giving that Santa Rosa retreat, uh, uh, and had to kind of leave in the middle of it uh, to attend my mother's funeral down in San Diego. Now there's just to to be mindful of the feeling, and rather than trying, I could see. The, the attempt to control, uh, not to cry, because uh, of the conditioning of the mind to, to not want to be seen with, with uh, 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 tears in my eyes. There was certainly that feeling. And there was also this feeling of loss. There's certainly a, a sense of, of grief at, at uh, the loss of my mother. But there's also mindfulness of it. It wasn't like an, I wasn't being kind of overwhelmed and lost in it, but there is certainly awareness of what, what I was actually feeling and accepting of that feeling. So it wasn't, it was neither indulgence, you know, just carrying on, uh, uh, feeling sorry for myself or weeping and wailing uh, uh, as a, a kind of just getting lost in, in crying or grief, nor was there, nor did I want to just hold it all back and, and reject, but to just be aware of what was, what way the conditioning of the mind and the, the, uh, the, the just the per perception of, of the one's mother being dead. And I remember uh, they were Roman Catholic, so we went uh, in the Catholic church in uh, Lakeside, in the, in uh, near uh, outside of San Diego, and then we, they were my mother was buried in the Catholic cemetery near San Diego, and we went out in a procession. Taking the the coffin was covered. No, my my family were not uh, into contemplating corpses, <laughs> and uh, so everything was nicely covered up. It's all right, and there she lies at 88 years old, 88 years old, uh, body uh, without life. And it would have felt like a complete, something was completed. I would have found that very, very good. But of course, um, that wasn't going to happen, so I wasn't going to push it either. Uh, then, going to the uh, cemetery, the graveyard, they put the, the coffin on this kind of contraption, and then the priest came and sprinkled it and, uh, with water and said some prayers, 
and then we were told to leave. And I would, I thought, well, I, I think I'll stay and just watch them bury the cob. They have to, they have to lower it into the, into the hole in the ground. And they said, nobody can stay. They were very insistent. We never allow anyone to, sa- and t- to stay. Uh, now the kind of caretaker will do the rest. You don't have to worry about it. You don't have to look at it. It's, it'll be all done properly. And I thought, well, I'd like to even help, you know, like put in a few shovels full of dirt. No way. And there was this sense of, you know, like a real sense of, of, uh, of loss, separation, the, the perception of death, mother, death, and that were, were refl- I was reflecting on it. Not cold-blooded kind of uh, analysis of it in any way, but uh, the mind open to what was actually happening in my mind and externally also. Well, I found that very helpful uh, way of, of dealing with the flow of life because these, this, this is what life is about, isn't it? We all have to uh, uh, go through these things. All of us have to see our loved ones die. Most of us. And hardly anyone gets out of that. If they die first, if you die young enough, maybe you get out of it. But in my age, uh, they're, they're, they're going pretty quick. And for much of my life, hardly anyone uh, I knew or was close to died. And then in the past five, six years, it just seems like they're, they're what, dropping like flies? Is that? <laughs> <laughs> or there's so many, so many deaths uh, that... Uh, and that in as Dhamma reflection, that's one of our main reflections. That all that is mine, beloved and pleasing, will become otherwise, will become separated from me. So that the Life, is, is, this is a part of our human experience. Watching our parents get old. Watching them get helpless and weak and even senile or paralyzed with pain and so forth and then die. This is, this is a part of everyone's life. This is, this is Dhamma. This is the way it is. And uh, this is uh, then our reflection on our own uh, emotional reaction. They're like this. What is death? As, what does the perception of death do to your mind? And in, now there's a lot of interest in, uh, in death and dying in, in England in our retreat center in Amavati. Uh, if you give a, a weekend retreat on death and dying, it is a full house. People are interested in death and dying. A few years ago, if you tried to give a retreat on that, nobody would come. What a morbid lot they are. You spend a weekend talking about death and dying, that's a really depressing. Because we regarded those, those uh, experiences as somehow unwanted and depressing and not and polite people just would not even talk about them or mention them in, in polite conversation. But now there is. Uh, people are waking up, isn't there? There's much more willingness to come to terms with the facts of life, with the way life is. So I would, people would say, what happens when, what do Buddhists believe when people die? Where did they go? And so they, of course, they're always after the, uh, some explanation of reincarnation. Is that's another subject that everyone's interested in these days. And reincarnation is, is a pretty interesting subject, especially if you were kind of some somebody like Cleopatra or <laughs> Napoleon in a previous life. An interesting, fantastic person. 
reincarnation is, is uh, you know, no objection to it. And, uh, but this isn't, this isn't the Dhamma, really, reincarnation. This isn't what we call it. Dhamma is reflecting on death. What does death do? When, when you say somebody's, what, I mean, what, when we say death, what is, how does that affect your mind? And so I would contemplate this and say death and I thought, and the only thing that I can uh, come up with is I don't know. I mean, I've heard various people give me their theories and uh, ideas and uh, views about death or what other people tell you, but I'm talking about my own experience, about the Dhamma that I am witnessing now, uh, the way it is now. And when, when you say, where, where did your mother go when she died? I don't know. Death is, is, stops my mind. But I mean, just to be nice about it, say, I'm sure she went to heaven. <laughs> I mean, if she didn't go to heaven, nobody's going to go to heaven. <laughs> she was a very, very good person. So, uh, uh, but that I don't know whether she's in heaven or not. It's not the, it's not the issue. So, so in, in our, uh, or what that really is, you know. If, if heaven for Christians is, my mother was worried about me being a Buddhist because she wanted me to go join her in the Christian heaven. I didn't have the heart to tell her that I'd much rather spend eternity with the Buddhists than with the Christians. <laughs> Life is like this, isn't it? Life is this way. Now we're alive and and, and this, is, this is what we reflect upon. Life is this way, it's breathing, it's a consciousness, it's feeling. It's the heat, isn't it? We're feeling heat. If we're not alive, we wouldn't even be feeling this heat because of life, isn't it? The sensitivity. And, uh, the, and we have these emotions. We, have lo we have, feel love and hate, attraction, aversion. Uh, we have instinctual drive sexual desires and hunger and uh, self-preservation and procreation of the species. These are, these are part of life. Life is this way. It's this, these bodies, they're alive so that they, this is why they feel the way they do. Why they have pain. Why they get hungry. Why they get too hot or too cold. Why they get old and sick and die, because, uh, because life is this way. So when we contemplate Dhamma, we're contemplating the way it is. And so you're, you're establishing the, the obvious fact that you're alive. And death is what you don't know. It's, you don't know death because this is life right now. The body is alive. So death is the unknown. So that's a Dhamma reflection. And, and we allow the unknown to be the unknown. And when the time comes, we'll know. We wait till the right time, die, and then you'll know. So this is w when we investigate Dhamma, or the way it is, we're, we're, we're always reflecting on the way, on life now. And when we're dying, then, we, then we'll do it when we're dying. And when the death moment comes, we'll do it. If we prepare ourselves now in understanding Dhamma and practicing Dhamma and realizing the truth, then we're ready to, when, when uh, it's time to relinquish these bodies, then that is also our realization, the, the process of dying to the death moment. Uh, then that is a mindfully mindfully, uh, a mindful experience.
Some people say that life is really uh, the preparation for death. Sometimes that's a very good reflection, isn't it? I mean, death is what we're all going to experience. You know, this is the, what you say, the certainty of life is a death. Everything else is uncertain. Death is certain. Death of the body, that is. So, so because of that certainty, it's an obvious, uh, obviously important experience. Birth and death. And then enlightenment is, is that theme and understanding between those two points. Between the birth of the body and its death, there is always the, the potential and the possibility of enlightenment, of seeing things as they are. Now enlightenment, another fraught word, isn't it? It sounds like, you know, thinking... I used to think enlightenment was like being kind of zapped by some fantastic light. You're sitting there under the Bodhi tree and suddenly this, this enormous light comes and kind of, and you're engulfed in this beautiful light. So, no, that couldn't be it because that would be a blinding light. I mean, if light's too strong, then it blinds you. You can't, it, you, you're not mindful, you, you lo- you're just... Uh, kind of overwhelmed by it. So enlightenment couldn't be a blinding light. It has to be the, the right amount of light to see things as they are. Contemplate that. It's the, uh, the enough light to be able to see. If there's too much light, you can't see. If there's not enough, you can't see. So that, that would that I could work with as, as a part of one's ordinary experience. Say, to use the wisdom, the ability the, of, of one, say, of a human being like myself, to, to bring light to a situation, to examine, to learn, to reflect, to contemplate, to investigate Dhamma, is bringing light to a situation. You're, you're, you're seeing things you have a, the, the, uh, the enough light to see clearly. This, this afternoon when I kind of encourage you to go out in, and uh, under the trees and that, uh, the, that's uh, to be with, to, to contemplate nature. And so that the, the like one can, can be, like I was saying, uh, the uh, this afternoon to to observe what nature does to your mind and uh, how easily we can we can be walking in the most kind of gorgeous and beautiful settings and be filled with all kinds of uh, ugly thoughts or worries and that we can this is you know, one one reason why I became a monk was because I was desperate. I was, you know, going to kind of, you know, sightseeing, going, having opportunities to go to all interesting, kind of wonderful places. And but my mind was just so kind of filled with fears and anxieties and self-consciousness, and and uh, just get so upset by things that that uh, sometimes it didn't seem to make any difference where you were at all. What good is it to go look at the Taj Mahal with a mind that's going to be somewhere else?
Now the meditation on ordinariness, say when you when you leave this retreat, if you you can you can really use your your life uh, to uh, to learn and to examine and to contemplate the Dhamma. And this you'll find uh, something very helpful to you to be able to not only for your own uh, um, improve the quality of your own life and understanding of it, but also in your relationships, in the professions and uh, and things that you have to do with life and the experiences that you have, the way life is going to be, the way it is for you. You begin to look at it in a way that that uh, you can uh, endure the unpleasant and you can enjoy the pleasant. One can say, one can delight or find great joy in the beauties of nature and in the goodness and 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 the uh, and in the truth of our existence, one delights and one finds joy in on those experiences. Life has its joyous quality. Being alive, we we feel when we when the mind is is with the good, the true, and the beautiful. There is the experience of joy, gladness, love of the of the of the good, the true, and the beautiful. This is part of our human experience, isn't it? When life gets in its unpleasant side, with sickness and death and and uh, pain and and uh, blame and all the the unpleasant aspects of our human state, we can bear this as dhamma also. Is a way of no preferences or choiceless awareness or these kind of words imply that, that, uh, that it's not a matter of choosing one side over the other, of just being with life as it, as it, and the conditions that we are experiencing. So then good is truly good, and bad is bad, but it's nothing more than that. Things are exactly what they are, they're not more than what they are. They're the suchness of them is that they're just this way. You're feeling uh, grief at the lot. Then it, grief is just grief. It's just the way it is. It's there's no nothing added or complicated. It's simple and direct. Things are precisely and exactly what they are. Honest and straightforward, uncomplicated, clear. And, and that is witnessing, observing the suchness of being. You know, when, when, we, when life presents us with, with success and praise and all the best, then success is just that. We don't create it. We, we can refrain from making anything out of it of adding ourselves to it, of hanging on or identifying with it. Success, we say we, we win the prize. We're, we're considered successful. It's success then is just that. And we see the Dhamma of success. And failure is just that. We're not adding, uh, we're not, we refrain from adding, I'm a failure, or how could life do this to me? kind of things, and failure is just what it is. Things are what they are. They arise, they cease, the condition arises and ceases in the unconditioned. This is a simple teaching and, and direct uh, uh, witnessing to it allows us to free ourselves from the tendencies to identify, attach, suppress, complicate every moment with uh, our fears, desires, worry, anxiety. So just to, to, to encourage you to, to uh, if, you, if, if I hope my 
explanation is, is adequate enough to convey that sense of what what is the Buddha, the Buddha seeing the Dhamma, the Buddha aware, witnessing the truth of the way it is. This this pattern, this conscious pattern of wisdom and truth. Buddha, the conscious knowing, the wise wisdom, a consciousness uh, influenced by wisdom, observing, witness, uh, noticing the truth of the way it is. So that, in, in, and each one of us witnessing to, even on the personal level, or the unique, enigmatic level of our own experience. As well as in the macrocosmic, microcosmic perspective. The the universal and the personal, the refined and the coarse, the high and the low. Now, I've, that I've been, <coughs> I think one of the things that has influenced me the most in the uh, Theravada school is, uh, is, that, is that statement about the created, unborn, unoriginated, arising and ceasing in the, created, in the uncreated, unborn, unoriginated. So that the, the, this, this is always, this somehow has uh, been a pattern I have very much used as uh, to reflect upon and to investigate. Because when I first came across it, 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 it baffled me. I didn't. I had never thought in those terms. And yet, the the you know one felt that 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 that, that was a probably a very accurate statement. Because the the uh, the or say the the theistic approaches of religion that I was raised with never really uh, never never really struck me as being uh, all that accurate because God and, uh, and creation and all these things were always in, the, always in personification. Isn't it? So that, that there, was, there is no way you could deal with, with uh, that without, without any attribute. There was no, there was no mention of emptiness or no self. It was all your soul, yourself, God as a, as a heavenly father, Jesus as the son. All these, there's, there's a total emphasis on personification, making up people. Virgin Mary, God the Father, uh, Jesus Christ the Savior. Uh, the whole thing seemed to, seemed to be around conditions alone. And of course, I, I went to this conference a few years ago in Berkeley, the Christian Buddhist conference. Interesting to see the uh, amount of concern, uh, especially ca Roman Catholicism, uh, has with uh, the Buddhist concept of emptiness. There was a, a great discussion, the Jesuit theologians and all the kind of... Uh, uh, Catholic uh, um, Catholic theologians were, were and and some of the uh, there was a Japanese expert on emptiness on Chunyata, and they were having these kind of super intellectual dialogues around nothing. <laughs> <laughs> because zero is is a very is a very useful thing to have, isn't it? And I just contemplate how zero works in in the numerical system. If you didn't have zero, you wouldn't be able to get rid of anything. You just multiply everything by zero, and you get nothing. But if you if you don't, you just end up getting more complicated. <laughs> so you. <laughs> Just they, all there is is addition. 
So you end up, you know, like like the, the problems with Christianity these days, the, the the theological problems lie in the fact that that they they haven't any way of of absolving any of their doctrines or letting go of anything. It's all the, the whole system has been so bound to conditions, doctrines, beliefs, vows, and and. Uh, uh, you know, and, and these these kind of uh, conditioned uh, conventions uh, of religion, and even God has is is almost fixed in a in a with attributes of a of a of a father figure, and so that that, that means that that God uh, is to a Buddhist, then it it doesn't work as as, as being. Say as as offering any real liberation because uh, you're still you're just going from one condition to the next even though it might be you might be going from coarse to refined you're still uh, what what you end up with is a refined condition rather than liberation where say in the the pattern of the condition arising and ceasing in the unconditioned allows the us to realize emptiness. No, no self, a way of, of letting go of everything, of always beginning anew, isn't it? No matter how many mistakes or complications in, that we make in life, we can always multiply it by zero. And then you've got nothing. <laughs> and so it dissolves, isn't it? It's, and then you, then you can... Uh, Start anew, the sense of renewal, and this is, I'm sure, in in any religion, this is, this is this can be found because it, in uh, Christianity they are uh, finding that 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 this is this is not kind of a totally alien, but has almost been forgotten, um, because of the emphasis on the conditioned realm, the 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 personification of the absolute. And the and the uh, uh, insistence on believing what you're what you're you know without giving much opportunity to investigate. That's why in Buddha Dhamma you can investigate because you you have to find this you realize this for yourself. You 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 find out about these things. You can prove it. You can realize it yourself. That's why, say, the Buddhist teaching is a teaching for to awaken rather than to just condition you into becoming institutionalized Buddhist. I mean, you can become institutionalized Buddhist, but then but that you won't be liberated through that. It's liberation comes through investigating and reali- realization and through cultivation of this this path which is based on the right understanding, the right intention, the right speech, right action, right livelihood. That's the, that's the active part. Isn't it? The path includes activity. It means we live our, our active life is, as conscious living beings is to use our, our, facility, our forces, our intelligence, our faculties for... Uh, doing it for right speech, right action, right livelihood. And then right concentration, right mindfulness, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. So that is the, the pattern of wisdom. Right understanding, right intention is, is the wisdom faculty. Then the sila, the moral faculty, right speech, right action, right livelihood. And then the samadhi, is the right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. That's the emotion. You find your heart in the in balanced and serene, peaceful, rather than emotionally kind of up and down. The samadhi, sama samadhi, or right right concentration is the peaceful heart, the unshakable heart, as Sister Tanisha was talking about last night. Unshakability—that 
compassionate heart that doesn't uh, waver and tremble with fears and desires. I'm not talking about the physical heart. So I offer this for your reflection.